We're still in the van. How'd you even get a parachute? I don't know, I'm just, I'm scared, I'm scared. I I've had a very exciting year this year. This is what I did recently. You know what I did recently? I went skydiving, which was awesome. Went, yeah, yeah. I went with that guy right over there, me and him. We have the same haircut. We, uh, you have to have that haircut to go skydiving. It's the law. Uh, I, went, I went skydiving, I went tandem, where they strap you to the dude, which was not my first choice. I, uh, <laughs> I wanted to go alone the first time, but it turns out the first time they don't let you go alone. They don't let you go alone because they figure you won't pull the chute in time, which is ridiculous, you know? <laughs> Plummeting to the earth at 125 miles an hour. I'm not the most punctual of people, but I'm gonna be on time for that one, you know? <laughs> I don't think I'll be late for that appointment. I'll probably be early. I'll probably pull the chute in the plane. Just... <sighs> I'm sorry. I don't... <laughs> We're still in the van. How'd you even get a parachute? I don't know, I'm just, I'm scared, I'm scared. I, don't... I, uh, I chose tandem, because when you go static, the other choice, you have to take an eight hour class, and I went to community college, so that sucked. I don't... <laughs> don't mean to brag, I, uh, thank you. I did go to community college. I didn't graduate, because you don't. <laughs> You just go for like five years, and then one day you look in the mirror and go, who are we kidding? Really? <laughs> it's community college, it's not really college. It's more of a holding place until your parents realize, maybe we didn't birth a winner. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure I was always headed down that path, you know? I was never one of those kids who heard, oh, there goes my little astronaut, or there goes the next president of the United States. My parents were more like, you're such a good eater. <laughs> Weird little kid, this little kid actually thought I had a superpower. I was convinced for three years that I had a real life superpower. It uh, turned out to be a lazy eye, which uh, <laughs> was uh, not that super, you know, just kind of creepy. <laughs> and, uh, well, it was a little super. My parents never worried when I was crossing the street because I was already looking both ways. So it's <laughs> less of a defect, more of a safety feature, really. You know. Look what ours came with, <laughs> the deluxe model. I don't... Lacey, that's kind of a rude term if you ask me. It's, it's the only medical condition where the doctor just blames that it's a lazy eye. They blame the patient. You never see that with any other medical condition. You don't need that wheelchair, lazy legs. Come on, buddy, I'm just gonna try harder. What are you, what are you doing with that respirator, lazy lungs? Come on, put some hair on your chest. I don't... Rude. I also have the ADD, I have the ADD, which uh, don't feel bad for me. If you're gonna have a three-letter disease, that's the one you want. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody get it who didn't go to community college? Cause that's uh, that one was one of those thinking jokes and that one really simmered throughout here. I feel like we got a couple of, uh, maybe, uh, the other reason I went tandem was you go tandem, you get a free fall for 30 to 45 seconds, which doesn't sound like a long time, but I did a little independent research. Turns out that is the exact amount of time it takes to wet your pants. <laughs> and the pants of the guy strapped to you. <laughs> I went my buddy Dave, and when we got to the skydive place, this guy comes up just to go over the rules. Apparently, if you're gonna strap some dude and just fall out of a plane, there's a lot of rules. I was unaware of this. He comes up to us, bro, which makes you nervous. You don't want to, you know, he's just way too excited, way too happy for that job, which is, I'm sorry, the wrong term. You want happy. You don't want to be strapped to the depressed guy. <laughs> Steer clear of that fella, you know. Buckle this tight and hold my note. What? I don't, can, I, can I get somebody else? I don't. He ended up not being our instructor. We just got our instructors afterwards and my buddy Dave gets strapped to this 25 year old girl and I'm like, sweet, strap one on. I love skydiving, you know? And then he had my instructor, a six foot six Russian guy named Vladimir. And I'm like, whoa! Mm -mm, mm -mm. Dave's having the time of his life. I'm learning what prison's like. This is not what I signed up for. Six foot six is a giant. I'm 5'7". It wasn't even like a harness at that point. It was more like a baby Bjorn. I'm walking out of the plane, feet don't even touch the ground. 
curl up in a ball, feel like a Joey in my mother's pouch. <laughs> Where are we going today? <laughs> it was terrifying. I don't know if you've ever spoken to a Russian person, but they're the most intense people in the world. They're terrifying. In Russia. Everything. In Russia. Every, in, in, every, in Russia. No parachute. <laughs> so intense. Tried to park it up and compare everything America to Russia. In America, we are going to take videotape of you as memento of skydive experience. <laughs> In Russia, we take plaster outline of where you hit on the ground, give to family. <laughs> Everything was in Russia. Even when we were falling out of the plane, he was all, in Russia, we do not pee on flight instructors. And, Take that one, you commie. That's for Rocky. USA, USA. Yeah, that's right. I'm winning the Cold War all over again with warm pee. All right, that's how we do it. I got a new job accidentally. Yeah, they say it's hard to find a job these days, but here's what I found out. If you park your car outside any bar at closing time and leave your car doors unlocked, whether you want to be or not, you're an Uber driver. <laughs> Drunk idiots will get into any unlocked car they can find. You can't keep them out. It's their new favorite activity. Let's get slammed and try to kidnap ourselves. What do you say? <laughs> it's amazing. The problem is we listen to our phones too much. We listen to our phones over people now, right? This guy got into my car, and I was like, get out of my car. And he's like, but my phone said I should be in your car. <laughs> like, it's my car. Get out. He's like, I don't know, my phone said. I was like, well, what's your phone number? <laughs> hey, get out of my car. Oh, I gotta go. I gotta go. My phone said. My phone said. Well, on that. I get it, I get it. I understand why we're all addicted to our phones. My phone is my entire brain now. I can't get anywhere without my phone because my phone's my maps, right? I can't do math without my phone. My phone's my calculator. I don't know any more phone numbers. If I get arrested and I get one phone call, I'm just prank dialing people at that point. You know, your refrigerator running? Ha <laughs> ha, I, I got nothing. I can either call 911, don't think that's gonna help. <laughs> or I gotta hope whoever has the phone number, 8675309. <laughs> Thank you, that was for the over 35. You guys, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not for you, sir, yeah. No, no, you don't have, you have no clue what that was. 867, what, I don't know what, hmm. Speed dial. Phones are our whole lives now. We're truly addicted to them. I know I'm addicted to my phone because the other day, I lost my phone, I tore apart my entire apartment immediately. Later that day, I couldn't find my kids at the park. I was like, they got legs, they'll be back. <laughs> yeah. It's true, there's, an, there's a cell phone addiction epidemic in this country. Everyone, one out of one Americans is addicted to their cell phone. <laughs> If you don't believe me, have you ever seen somebody with a low charge looking for an outlet? Oh my word. I've seen junkies less aggressive. Are you kidding me? Like, oh, you got an outlet in there? Oh, what's going on? Hey man, you gotta help me out. Just like 15%. You just gotta, come on, you gotta help a brother out. I just need a taste, man. I just need a taste. Come on. I gotta finish this podcast. You gotta help me. Even when we talk about our phones. We talk about them like they're family. Does your phone run out of battery? No, it's dead. <laughs> My phone died. It's a pretty aggressive term for something you can plug back into the wall, don't you think? <laughs> How's your day going? Not good. My grandma died. Oh, I know what it's like. My phone died. <laughs> Are you going to plug your grandma back in? How'd she die? She drowned. Oh, just put her in rice. She'll be fine in the morning. <laughs> Make sure you plug the holes first. It's impossible to get the rice out of those holes. I don't I like you guys. You laugh once, and then you take a second, and you're like, yeah, we're gonna laugh again. <laughs> I thought I was done. A little bit more. You guys laugh like your grandpa pees. That's what it is. Oh, 
Oh no, there's a little bit on my pant. Oh. I'm amazed that anybody even takes Uber. It's crazy. That's, that's how much you trust our phones 12 years ago. Never hitchhike. What are you crazy? Get in some stranger's car? Two days later, my phone told me to. So I got to I mean, what did your parents tell you as kids? Never take candy from strangers. And if anybody ever tells you to get in their car, you kick them in the shin and run screaming fire. Now what do I do? I'm going to call a stranger. And if he has candy in his car, oh, oh five stars. <laughs> He's getting a good rating. That's crazy. That's crazy. How is there any rating system to Uber? There should only be two ratings. Only two. Alive? Murdered. Those are the only two. You go to a stranger's car in the middle of the night and made it home alive. Five stars. My friends have the nerve to complain. His car smelled. I'm sorry. Are you in a duffel bag right now? No? Five stars. My set tonight is brought to you by Lyft. <laughs> Sponsorship opportunities. So I live in New York City. It is uh, easily the grossest city on the planet, bar none. This is how disgusting New York City is. A doctor from New York City went to Africa. He contracted Ebola. He came back to New York City. He then rode the subway all over the city. All over. No one else got Ebola. That's right, the germs already on the train. Beat the heck out of Ebola before anybody else could even get sick. Are you coming on my turf? Are you the your heart? You're from Africa, I'm from the Bronx. You wanna do this? I got friends. Bring it. We have the strongest immune systems just from going to work. I'm not even gonna vaccinate my kids. I'm just gonna have them lick stuff on the subway. <laughs> Sir, your daughter's chewing on the seat. She better, that's her flu shot this year. Keep going. I don't need health insurance, I got a Metro card. We're gonna be fine. Rush hour is the best, they cram in those trains so tight. Every time the train moves, it's like a full body physical from everybody around you. <laughs> You're standing right next to the right person. You're gonna learn some stuff. <laughs> I was cramming there so tight last week, I found a lump in some lady's neck. <laughs> I was like, ma'am, I hate to bother you, but the sign says if you see something, say something. <laughs> I don't wanna get that checked out. <laughs> I live in Brooklyn, I live with my uh, girlfriend. We're in a uh, pretty serious relationship. Uh, we are married. Uh, I think this might be the one. You never know. It's, uh, <laughs> no, my girlfriend is, or my wife is awesome. She is a, uh, she is a doctor. So laugh, don't laugh. I don't need your money. <laughs> I win. Yes. That's right. I, uh, I started dating her because I didn't have health insurance. And uh, yeah, I was like, all right, friends with benefits. Um, goes both ways, because apparently if you date a comedian, you gotta write him off on your taxes as a dependent. <laughs> Pick one up. She actually had to be a doctor on a plane recently, which was crazy. We were uh, flying, and there was a medical emergency on board, and she had to help out. We were flying to uh, Denver, Colorado, on a Spirit Airlines, because she's a terrible doctor. And, uh, <laughs> Oh, you've flown it? It's the public bus of airlines. It's absolutely <laughs> horrific. I don't know if you guys actually know how it got its name. About 35 years ago, an entrepreneur was like, listen, I'm gonna put wings on a Greyhound bus and nobody's gonna stop me. And somebody else was like, that's the spirit. <laughs> it's the worst airline in the world. Anyway, we were halfway there and the sky witch comes on and she goes, oh my gosh, somebody's been hurt. Is there a doctor on board? And everybody laughed and laughed and laughed because it's spirit. <laughs> There's barely a pilot on board. You couldn't she was like, seriously, calm down. Is there anyone with any medical experience? Is there a nurse, uh, an EMT? She started getting really desperate. Is there a lifeguard? Is anyone watching Grey's Anatomy? Is there anybody that can do anything? Uh, finally, my wife goes up front and starts helping this lady out and the pilot comes out of the cockpit. And she was like, I didn't know you were here. Uh, <laughs> and, and he goes, thank you so much for helping out. He goes, since this is a medical emergency, 
and you're the doctor on board. He goes, you're now in charge of the plane. Yeah, true story, true story. He goes, you tell me when and where to put this thing down, and I'll do it. And I was like, Hawaii, Hawaii. <laughs> What a vacation. <laughs> My wife and I have been married for seven years now, and it's wonderful, I absolutely love it. It's, it's amazing, it's, it's amazing, it ch it change, everything changes once you get married, once you spend all of that time with somebody. You don't understand, you cannot comprehend the range of emotions you could feel for a person until you're married, until you spend every day with that person. <laughs> You know, like sometimes I'll come home late at night after doing shows and I'll, I'll see my wife sleeping in our bed and I'll think to myself, my God, I'm the luckiest man in the world. Yeah, I can't believe that this woman would spend a moment with me, let alone her entire life. I can't believe how blessed I am. And sometimes, <laughs> I'll come home late at night after doing shows and I'll see that same woman in that same bed. And I'll think to myself, I could put this pillow. <laughs> and that's what love is, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> love is putting down that pillow. <laughs> Trying to keep the spark alive. You gotta keep the spark alive. I read recently the best way to keep the spark alive in a relationship is you gotta keep the mystery. You gotta keep mystery in the relationship to keep the spark alive. After reading that, I started hiding my wife's stuff. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, where are my keys? And I'm like, romance is in the air. Mm. My wife and I did take our relationship to the next level recently. We got a Costco membership. Uh, <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, ma yeah, yeah. Marriage is till death, but 300 toothbrushes, that's forever. I, I had never been to a Costco. It's an amazing place. If you haven't been, it is a club. There's a, it's a very exclusive club. There's a membership process you have to go through. You have to stand in a line and you have to give them $60. That's the whole process. And, uh, and then you get in there and it's a magical wonderland. It's like a dark mirror that shows you all of your bad habits, but magnified a thousand times. I went in there and I saw a brick of cheese the size of a car battery, and I was like, yeah! <laughs> the expiration date said three weeks, and I was like, it's go time, let's do this! Yeah. I haven't pooped in a month and a half, but I finished it. Yeah. Yeah. The money you save on toilet paper alone, it is an amazing story. It's wonderful, it's wild. They give you samples, which I find hilarious. Did you like that little bite of hot dog? Would you like 486 of them? <laughs> you can have that. <laughs> they have an optometrist there, so you can get your eyes checked. I don't need my eyes checked. I need a cardiologist. Did you see my cart? I bought 43 pounds of bacon. <laughs> I don't need contacts, but I'm gonna need a couple stints by the uh, end of this week. I went, the first time I was there, I walked in there and I saw clothes and I thought that was so funny. I thought that was so ridiculous. I'm like, they have clothes at Costco. That is, who is buying clothes at Costco? And then I got my cart to the checkout and I looked at all the food that I was gonna put in my body and I said, wait, I'm gonna need bigger pants. <laughs> My wife and I also went to Ikea recently because we hadn't been in a fight in a while. And, uh, that will do it. You can't go to Ikea and not get into a fight. It's amazing. I think Ikea planned it that way. Just a maze of confusion and frustration all designed to get couples to break up so they have to furnish two households. It's a genius company. My wife and I have fought so much at Ikea. At this point, my wife even mentions Ikea. We get into a fight immediately, not even about Ikea. The other day, she goes, we need to go to Ikea, get a new bookshelf. She goes, we, uh, she goes should, we, should we get another 56 inch one? Or should we get the 79 inch one? She goes, we got 82 inch ceilings. Do you think the 79 inch one will look weird? And I was like, I hate your mother. <laughs> I don't even know how these fights happen. <laughs> My wife proposed to me. A lot of times, it's the other way around, you know. 
So it was, it, every, it, was, it was a real surprise when she proposed to me. You know, when a man proposes to a woman, it's never a surprise, really, because you ladies hint pretty hard, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm kind of cold on my ring finger. Uh, <laughs> so it's time to warm it up, you know. <laughs> no, but my wife, she did. She proposed to me. It was very romantic. I, I remember, like, it was yesterday. She uh, came over to me one night, and she was like, oh, I'm pregnant. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh, I never thought you'd ask. Oh. <laughs> You're like such a lady. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> kids, kids. I think God's little joke is you get nine months to plan, right? You find out you're gonna have a baby, and then you get nine months to make all these plans for you're gonna be a different parent than every other parent you've ever met. And as soon as you have that baby, all those plans just right out the window. <laughs> My wife and I were telling people all this ridiculous stuff that was never gonna come true. Oh, we're never gonna argue around the kids. <laughs> Only happy. <laughs> So smug, so cocky, you know. Oh, we're never gonna put our kids in front of the TV. Only books for our kids. <laughs> Stuff that's never gonna come true, you know. We're not gonna shake them. You make... <laughs> All of these plants. <laughs> kids are so expensive, it's amazing. I'm raising two children in Manhattan. I recently, I heard in Brooklyn, I recently read that the average cost of raising a kid from zero to 18 was $250,000. I turned to my seven-year-old and I said, you are over budget. <laughs> you got one more birthday, then it's time for a J-O-B. <laughs> Flying with kids was the one that got me because you got to buy them tickets. I don't know if you know this, but you don't pay for yourself. You don't even carry your own bags, do you? You do? You're a better kid than mine. <laughs> tradesies, tradesies, no? So what I've decided to do to cut costs is I'm gonna register my kids as emotional support animals. Uh, <laughs> have them fly for free, yeah. Good news, we're going to see grandma. Bad news, get in your kennel. Let's go, we only got one ticket. <laughs> Bathroom, you got a wee-wee pad. Take care of it, you're right. So we have, we have two daughters, uh, one is seven, and the other one is trying to kill me. And, I'm kidding, they're both trying to kill me. I, now my daughters, here, here's how old they are exactly. They still want to be called big girls, which will change. <laughs> I don't know the exact age where that changes, that is an important milestone in a young woman's life, because right now that's all my daughters want out of life. I want to be a big girl, they don't care about anything else. You're beautiful, I don't care, you're a big girl. I'm a big girl! You, you call them big girl, they lose their minds. You're a big girl, I'm a big girl! And all I do all day is I stay home with them all day, I'm like, hey, you're a big girl, and they lose it. I'm a big girl, what's my big girl gonna do? Anything you tell me to! And the other day, my wife was having a rough day, so I was like, hey, I'll pay the wife a compliment. She got home, I was like, hey, honey, you're a big girl. <laughs> she was like, I will stab you in your sleep. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> what a big girl thing to do. <laughs> Stand up past your bedtime, look at you. <laughs> I got to watch my wife give birth, which was pretty amazing. Uh, hats off to you ladies, you win at everything forever, always, forever. I think it's people out to watch that. Yeah, yeah, that is, wow. Oh, that is intense, yeah. Whoo! <laughs> I learned one thing watching my wife give birth, and that is this, there is no reason for, uh, Father's Day. <laughs> yeah, at least not a whole day, you know, like maybe part of a day, like Father's Afternoon or something. I just, I just think you should get out of it what you put into it. You know, Happy Father's <laughs> Minute. <laughs> that is the participation trophy of holidays. Every Father's Day gift should just say participant on it. You're like, hey, you were there too, huh? Because what does a woman do to earn Mother's Day? She creates life. She sacrifices her body to bring another human being into this world. What does a man do for Father's Day? Don't you go there. <laughs> 
<laughs> what does a man do? He reminds that woman to breathe. <laughs> Participant. <laughs> the birth process proved to me that my wife loves my children a thousand times more than she loves me. <laughs> because my daughters both, on the way out, ripped her body apart and she has not mentioned it to them once! <laughs> not in anger! Not, oh, you won't put your shoes on. You have no idea. Not once. <laughs> Yet five years ago, I broke a Fiesta Wear bowl that is no longer in production. <laughs> I have heard about it daily. <laughs> My wife dresses me. She doesn't do it the normal way, though, telling me what to wear. She just tells me what not to wear. And then if I keep wearing it, it disappears. <laughs> a month ago, I had a red hat. She was like, I don't like it when you wear that red hat. Two days later, gone. <laughs> a week after that, I was wearing a pair of jeans with a rip in them. She was like, you look like trash when you wear those jeans with the rip in them. Two days later, missing! <laughs> Yesterday, she was like, I don't like your friend, Eric. I was like, dude, you gotta move. You gotta get out of here. <laughs> Run, she's coming for you. Based on my head and my pants, you got two days. Get out of here! <laughs> she proposed to me, which is nice, because as we all know, proposing is giving up. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't think proposing is giving up, look at any sport where a man has to give up. He has to do the exact same physical action. Football, guy kicks off, receiver catches the ball, he's deep in the end zone, other teams all around him, there's no possibility he can move down the field whatsoever. If he even tries, he's going to be beaten into the ground. He has to give up. So what does he do? He drops down to one knee. <laughs> in boxing, when a man is too tired to continue to fight for even his own life, it's the middle of the round, he wants to give up, what does he do? He drops down to one knee. <laughs> and when a man has dated a woman for so long that he could no longer dress himself or speak on his own behalf. <laughs> He comes to this realization. He says, you know what? It's time to give up. <laughs> so what does he do? He drops down to one knee. He says, I love you. Here's your championship ring. <laughs> Thank you so much, you guys. I'm Joe Larson.